Hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Abby Frappenpool, and on behalf of Happify, I'm thrilled to welcome you to our webinar today, How to Age with Purpose. Thank you so much for being here and dedicating an hour of your busy schedules to us. Here at Happify, we understand how important it is to have purpose in your life at any age. As we get older, the amount that purpose affects us both mentally and physically is immense. And so we want to help you navigate that and learn how to, scout, to discover your purpose. And to that end, I'm really excited and honored to be able to host our expert, Richard Leiter, to speak to you today. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our expert today. Internationally best-selling author and coach, Richard Leiter is the founder of InVenture, the purpose company. He's written 11 books, including three bestsellers. In his latest book, Who Do You Want to Be When You Grow Old, was just published this past July. Leiter has taken his purpose message to all 50 states, Canada, and four continents, and has advised leaders at more than 100 organizations, from the AARP to the U.S. State Department. And with that, Richard, I am going to turn this over to you. Well, hello, everybody. And Abby, thank you very much for having me here today. And so how's everybody doing in these pandemic days? I hope take a deep breath and uh, sit back and uh, look at uh, purpose. And uh, uh, I have uh, I listen for a living as a coach, as a writer, et cetera, as a researcher. And uh, I one of the humorous things that I heard recently, which relates to our topic here today, was one of my colleagues who on his answering machine leaves this message. Uh, uh, at the sound of the tone, please leave your answer to life's two eternal questions. Who are you and what do you want? So with purpose, who are you and what do you want are two very universal questions. And uh, what I have observed in my study is that we want two things. We want to belong and we want to matter. And so I want to talk about those today. How do we belong in this era that we're living in? How do we matter and why is it important? Why should I, I, I care? I Googled recently, find my purpose, and I got about 1.2 billion hits. Do you ever feel that purpose is just too big, too big of a thing to get your arms around, or maybe something you can postpone till some other stage of life or some other condition. Well, I want to talk today about purpose with a big P, which is probably what you think about when you think about purpose, something that's noble and big and cause related, and purpose with a small P, which is really where I want to dwell today. Purpose with a small P is everyday purpose. And how do we enjoy our lives and live lives that are purposeful uh, on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. And uh, so I want to give a checkup. You might take your car in for a checkup. You might do a medical checkup. You might do a financial checkup, physical checkup, et cetera. How about a life checkup, a purpose checkup? If you have a pulse, you have a purpose. And so I want to talk about what that purpose might look like and do a checkup on your pulse. So. Are you getting old or growing old? I have some overheads here, some PowerPoints that I'd like to use to illustrate kind of what this talk really is, is all about. They're, they're really images in uh, mo uh, mostly. And so um, the question is, uh, I'm gonna talk about unlocking the power of purpose. And the question I'm asking now is, are you getting old? or growing old? Well, spoiler alert, you're getting old. Every one of us is getting old from, from birth. And we grow up twice. We go through two stages of growing up and growing old. First is from childhood to adulthood. And then what we're talking about today is the big leap from adulthood to elderhood and outgrowing and leaving behind adulthood and growing into uh, elderhood. Uh, perhaps. And I want to mention that that this purpose thing, I hope you had a sigh of relief when I said purpose with a small p. But purpose is fundamental. 
it's not a luxury. It's not a luxury for the wealthy or the educated or in a, or the, a particular gender or ethnicity or religion. It is fundamental and universal to who we are as, as uh, human beings. And so I've been interviewing people over the age of 65 for about four decades and asking them if they could live their life over again, what would they do differently? And what I found are three things that you might make a mental note of here. If, if I was asking you this question, uh, what do you want to do? Uh, you know, what did you learn and what would you do differently if you could live your life over again? Three things. Number one, they said they'd be more reflective. And reflective means they'd step back like we're doing today and look at the big picture. And I said, well, why didn't you do that? They said the same thing over four decades. Too busy, always going somewhere, never being anywhere until there's a crisis, a crucible in life that we have to, that forces us to step back and, and look at the big picture. So we're, we're pushing the pause button to reflect a bit today. Secondly, they said they would be more courageous. They would take more risks. And the areas they would take more risks are work and love. Sigmund Freud had it right when he said, these are the two areas, work and love, that give us the greatest pain and the greatest pleasure in, in many, many ways. So I wanna talk about what that means because sometimes we're pushed by pain and sometimes we're pu pulled by possibility when we look at our, our lives and that forces us really to go deeper, uh, to look at the big, the big picture. And the third thing, universally was people said, I want my life to matter. Mattering matters. Every human being I've interviewed, thousands through studies and writing and speaking, and uh, not with, with every soul I've had the, the pleasure of, of really looking deeply with wants their life to matter. And so uh, mattering matters. We need three things in life. We need money, we need medicine or health, and we need meaning. I call it the three M's just for memory's sake here, but money, medicine, meaning health and meaning. You all know people who are, uh, who have enough medicine and enough, and I don't mean medicine as in pharmaceuticals or pills, but health and have enough money, perhaps enough, but don't have meaning and are miserable. And you know, other people who don't have enough health and enough money who perhaps are living a fulfilled life. So we're looking at that choice here. So purpose in, in everyday life is purpose, the way I talked about it in this next slide, is purpose with a small p. And purpose is the answer to the question, why do I get up in the morning? Why do I do what, what I do? Purpose is a verb. Purpose is a verb. It's an action. It's something we do. There are 1,440 purpose moments in a day. 1,440 moments, and if you take sleep out of it, it'd be less uh, moments in, in, in a day to make a difference in another person's life. So action precedes clarity when it comes to purpose. We find our purpose and we unlock it through doing things, not just through thinking about it or reflecting on it. Secondly, purpose is a path. Purpose is, is uh, everybody on this call is an experiment of one an experiment of one. You get to make, choose and make your own choices about your life uh, moving forward and present, present day. So I wanna talk and share with you, what is this path for, for purpose? And third, purpose is a practice. It's something, as I said, we do every day. Purpose is always beyond the self. It brings meaning to your own life and it brings makes a difference in other people's life. So purpose is always uh, reaching out uh, beyond the self. I use this picture here because uh, I love the quote from E.B. White. Now, he's an American essayist who wrote this. He said, I arise in the morning, torn between a desire to save the world and a desire to savor the world. This makes it hard to plan the day. Well, in all due respect to E.B. White, it makes it easier to plan the day because a good life is often one where we both save meaning not literally save, but we make a difference in other people's lives. And we savor, we enjoy uh, li uh, life in, in many ways. And so we're talking here about not having a purpose, we're talking about living purposefully. And so purpose is, as I said, is fundamental. So you see this pill in this picture? Uh, I did a PBS special 
called The Power of Purpose, which happens to be the title of one of my, my books. And so uh, this slide that shows purpose, or shows uh, a doctor actually holding up a pill. Uh, the pill, I, when I did a PBS special, I worked and spent time in neuroscience labs, clinical settings across the country before doing the special. And one of those neurologists who was a researcher said to me, Richard, you see this pill? Would you buy it? And I said, well, what does it do? And he said, well, first of all, it uh, reduces the effects of Alzheimer's and mild cognitive impairment. It uh, helps with sleep disorders and sleep apnea. It reduces macroscopic stroke by as much as 41%. And it adds uh, four to 10 years to your life. And I went, wow, I mean, is that really? And he said, and I said, well, how much does it cost? And it was in existence. And he smiled and he said, yes, it's purpose. We now can measure purpose in the brain, purpose in different areas of, of, of the brain. And, um, and he said, purpose is now fundamental. It won't be long till your doctor gives you a prescription that says, Richard, you need a why, W-H-Y. You need a why, a reason to get up in the morning beyond yourself. You need to make a difference in, in certain, certain ways. And so both science and faith agree that purpose is, in fact, fundamental. That aging, in fact, is not a disease. There are choices. It's a, it's a design challenge. And uh, so let me share with you uh, a prescription right now. So if you think it's big P, it's too big of a deal, let's look at P with a little, let's look at the little P and please make a note of this. And I'm gonna bring this up in a few minutes again. The universal purpose after almost 50 years of study with people around the world is only two words, grow and give, grow and give. So think about, are you growing and giving on a day-to-day -day basis? Growing so you have an aliveness and a curiosity and something to give and giving where you're making a difference in, in other people's lives. And so it, it's a mindset. This next slide is really important to me. It's from a man named Viktor Frankl, who I had the a privilege of not only studying in school, but actually spending a week after graduating with uh, advanced degrees in, in counseling psychology, I found that Viktor Frankl was giving a speech, not a speech, he was giving a, a seminar, a, a live seminar with himself in person in San Diego. Now, I was in Denver. I made my way out there and got my way into this seminar and it changed my life forever. You've all had in your life fortuitous encounters with others that changed your trajectory and changed your life. Mine was with this man, Viktor Frankl. If you don't know, he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. He was in uh, three years of Nazi concentration camps. His, his pregnant wife, Tilly, his grandparents, parents, and siblings were killed. He, he survived. He was liberated from Auschwitz, and he went back to Vienna, where he was a physician, a neurologist, and a psychiatrist studying uh, purpose and out, what he called logotherapy, meaning therapy. And he talked about tragic optimism, helped people survive in tragic situations. And he said this, the last of the human freedoms is to choose, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. This was so profound. For five straight days, you could hear a pin drop as this man, Viktor Frankl, talked about choices and the attitude of tragic optimism. And he said, between stimulus and response, is there's a choice, there's a stimulus and you respond and between the two, we have choice. And that's what the power of purpose is all about is that choice where we have growth and freedom. And so um, he said this, don't ask what is, what is my purpose, ask this, what is life asking of me now, right now, today in this situation? And what's my attitude? Do I have an attitude of, in a tragic situation. And he said this, say yes to life in spite of everything, which has kind of become a mantra for me. Say yes to life in spite of, of everything. And so let's look at this question next. What did you want to be when you grew up? 
what did you want to be when you, you grew up? This is the old model I grew up with, the old life model. Personal growth on the left side going up and uh, aging going from left to right, from childhood to adolescence to adulthood to retirement to old age. This is the old linear model of, of, of aging. Learn, earn, retire. That model today is increasingly dying. Very few people want this model anymore. This was in an era where life was shorter. In the US in, 19, in the early 1900s, the life expectancy was 47. Today, and it's this way in different parts of the world, uh, wherever you are, you can check your own data. But today, the fastest growing cohort in the US is 85 and over. And there will be 10 times more centenarians in 10 years than there are today, people living to 100. And so this model was about a freedom from, I can't wait to retire and get free from whatever the life was that people were living. And it was a harsher life, perhaps, uh, uh, back then. But what did you want to be when you grew up? Well, uh, uh, many people started living what we call a default life. So, and they're still today looking in the rear view mirror. How do I stop living a default life is one of the chapters uh, in my new, my new book. I'm a fan of uh, bookshops. I love to go to bookstores. Of course, I can order them online, et cetera, during these areas, but I love browsing in bookstores, et cetera. And I was in a bookstore not so long ago, in fact, and I asked the lady at the information desk when I walked in, I said, can you tell me where the self-help section is? And she smiled and said, well, if I tell you, won't that defeat the whole purpose? Well, I laughed. She laughed, and she directed me to this self-help uh, place where there's a whole uh, stacks of books on living a new kind of life and aging and purposeful aging and things like this. So it's, it's good to look in the rearview mirror, to look at where we've been, look at how we got there. But a default life is one where you're, you've kind of lived on automatic. You lived according to society's or parental standards, not your own. And at certain times in life, we reach those triggering events where we do pause because we're pushed by pain or pulled by possibility to say, how do I stop living this life? And how do I stop start living a new kind of life that's more authentic uh, in, in certain ways? And we and look at, at reimagining. So, and so I wanna take a poll here for a minute, stop and take a poll and ask this question. How many of you find yourself living a default life? Just check one of the boxes very, very quickly. Default life is a life that is not yours these days. It's not as authentic as you'd like it to be. You've just kind of signed on to what was and what might be in certain, in certain ways. And um, of, as opposed to living what we call the good life, which we're going to look at in, in a minute. So are you living a default life? Make a choice. All right, so it's, it's a mixed bag. Some not at all, some good, you know, so partial yes, partial no. So uh, that's very helpful to know. And I think that really reflects the diversity of people on here and their situations in, in uh, life. And so the question then arises as we age, who do you want to be when you grow old? Whether you're living the default life or not, who do you want to be when you grow, grow old this is the new model of aging that I've been studying and writing about now for a long time. Because we've added, as you see here, this new life stage, there is a dip there in midlife. Midlife is often, and midlife is not exactly age related, but let's just say it's about 45 to 60 in certain ways. Yeah, you know, it's hard to use numbers like that, but there is something called the U curve of happiness, a dip in midlife. But then you see there's this uptick where the happiest time of life in current studies uh, uh, often can be later in life Inst instead of a life of decline uh, or default, uh, we can in fact live what we might call uh, a good life. So there is this new life phase. It's the freedom to reimagine life. 
I have uh, wrote, I wrote a book called Life Reimagined and another book called Work Reimagined. And this new book is about reimagining aging in, in certain ways. What are the real possibilities here? What do we have the freedom to do? As Viktor Frankl said, say yes to life in spite of, of, of everything. And so how do I start living a good life? Let's look at some practices here. And uh, how do I start, stop lo looking in the rear view mirror and start looking through the windshield? You know, the windshield, as you see in this next slide here, is way bigger than the rear view mirror. What are the possibilities? Doesn't mean that your life has been bad or not are necessarily even default in certain ways, but how do you start living the good life and what is the good life? And uh, so I uh, have been studying the good life and one of my colleagues is a philosophy professor, David Shapiro in Seattle, Washington. And David and I wrote a book called Repacking Your Bags, Lighten Your Load for the Good Life. And the good life as we studied it and being a philosopher, we went all the way on David's part, me being a psychologist, he went all the way back to uh, Aristotle, Plato and others and then research the good life. And then we interviewed many, many people to look at what is the good life today. And we came up with four characteristics in addition to health and money, which we talked about early, uh, earlier. The good life has four characteristics, place, people, right work, and purpose. Are you living in the place you love with the people you love, doing the work you love with purpose? Now, work doesn't have to be paid work or career. It could be avocational. It could be any kind of work. So right work is the way you spend your days, uh, depending on your age and stage of life and, and, and circumstances. So it could be hobby work or, or any, any, anything else. And so uh, how do I start living a good life? Well, yeah, but what if I have uh, a disease? Well, one of the stories in this new book is a man named, about a man named Ed Rapp. Ed was uh, one of three presidents of a company called Caterpillar. You've probably sometimes seen the big yellow earth moving equipment called Cat, Caterpillar. He was one of three presidents at age 57, about to become a candidate to be CEO of the whole company. And uh, he was coming back from a, a trip abroad, out for a run with his son and he noticed his foot was flapping and dragging and he was couldn't figure it out. And so he checked it out after a period of time after denying that he had any problems and he was diagnosed with ALS. Well, he's about six years into his diagnosis with ALS, which is often a five to seven year sentence. No cure and uh, no, no uh, don't know the cause yet, yet. And so Ed, has purpose with a big P and purpose with a little P. He decided to resign, retire, move back to Raleigh, North Carolina, where he lives. And he created a foundation called Live Strong ALS. He's raised so far almost $15 million for ALS research, which he'll never see because you know he'll pass on before they'll probably find a cure for it or something. And little P, he gets up every single morning at eight o'clock, Eastern Standard Time in the US, and he listens and counsels somebody who was just diagnosed with ALS, somebody who he's never met, will never meet, but he, he says, this is the good life, Richard. It's not the life I chose, but I'm choosing to make what I can of it. I'm saying yes to life by helping the big P cause of ALS and the little p purpose of making a difference in someone's life. And he says, I feel so alive and so uh, like this is something I can do for, for life. And so we all have conditions that keep us from living ex the exact life we want. But the starting point is to, to define what is the good life um, for you. So let me do one more poll here and ask you this question. Are you living the good life? your vision of a good life. Are you living in the place you love, with the people you love, doing the work you love with purpose? So give yourself a score from one to five. Five for sure, one, no, 
two, three, four, somewhere in between. And let's see what kind of a, a diverse sample we have here uh, with this whole notion of the good life. And what Ed Rapp says to me, and it's, it's a chapter in this new book, he said, I just want to earn a passing grade in life. I just want to earn a passing grade in life. I want the, my life to matter. And so the question is, will you earn a passing grade in life? So here again, we have, you know, a diversity and you may be living the place you love, but the people issue might be a challenge or the people issue might be great, but the place isn't there or the work uh, is not exactly right. And purpose that we'll be talking about and I'll be sharing some, some practices. So, so thank you for taking this, this poll. And will you, earn, will you earn a passing grade? Then another word for purpose is calling. And so is your calling calling? Victor Frankl, when I saw him, drew this on a blackboard. And you remember blackboards and the, the horizontal line here from failure to success, he said represents the outer world, the outer life of success in, you know, usually in terms of money and things in, in, in life. The vertical line from despair to meaning represents fulfillment. And so uh, in certain ways, he said, what we want is success with fulfillment in, in life. Success meaning enough resources and fulfillment, you know, living the, the good life that we want. On the lower left, he said, uh, what we have here in this next slide is a job. So if uh, the lower left-hand box is a job. And uh, are you, do you have a job or have you had a job? You know what that's like. It, it, it's not about much. I think there's another slide coming up here that shows job in the lower left-hand corner. And um, there we go. And then the next box on the right is career. Sometimes we have enough. We're going up the ladder of success but we're not feeling like, you know, it could be burnout, could be rust out, boredom, could be a lot of different things, but uh, uh, sometimes we're, or we retire. And the, and the upper left is mission. Sometimes we have to have a job in order to fulfill a mission that we do uh, after work or in other ways. But what I, what I found really compelling was the upper right-hand box calling. Calling is the inner urge to want to matter, to give your gifts uh, away. One of life's most dangerous questions is this, well, what do you do? So next time someone says, when you're at in a social setting or a new setting, well, what do you do? Say, uh, I'm passionate about, what are you passionate about? Because what do you do is dangerous because it puts you in a box. Well, I'm retired. Oh, how oh, boring. Or I'm doing this, uh, not interested. And you are not what you do. You are who you bring to what you do. And so um, in many ways, the pandemic has caused mi millions and millions of people to force uh, to think about this question and turn crisis into calling. And so let me give you a napkin test. I call it the got a minute school of coaching. It came from actually this napkin which was on an airplane. And after my PBS special, I was flying to London, sitting next to somebody who kept bugging me. And I said, I have to get some rest because I have to give a speech when I get there. And they said, oh yeah, but can you help me? Have you got a minute? Can you tell me what to do with the rest of my life? I just lost my job, et cetera. And so I said, well, write this formula on a napkin because a lot of the best ideas come out on napkins and people then keep those napkins in social settings, et cetera. And uh, the napkin test has the formula for discerning your calling. And calling is another word for, uh, for purpose. And uh, so uh, the napkin test is gifts plus passions plus values equals calling. So let's talk for a second here about this gifts thing. What are gifts? Gifts are really talents that you've had since you early in life, often. I, I uh, created a, an exercise, a tool called Calling Cards. And Calling Cards uh, helps people to discern their gifts. And there are four different things I wanna mention about gifts. So think about your gifts, your talents. 
And number one is something you love to do. Take us something you really love to do. Number two, others observe you doing it effortlessly, superbly, and might want to come to you to actually learn or get help with it themselves. Third, the biggie, you can't recall learning. When I created the calling cards exercise to help people with, with gifts, I went back and interviewed parents and uh, uh, teachers and siblings and others. And, and then in, I often ask people, if, if you have, how many of you have siblings? And many, many hands go up. Are your siblings' gifts the same as yours? And there's laughter in the room because people say, no, 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 my, they're all, we were all different. We're all raised in the same family in the same environment, but gifts differing. And so I said, well, when did you notice that? Oh, real early in life. So the third thing is you can't recall learning it. It's just something that your hand has turned to naturally. It's come to you forever and you can't recall learning it. And um, fourth, but you do love practicing it and learning more about it. So what is one of your gifts? Uh, one of my gifts is listening. As I said, I listen for a living. And very early in life, I was a listener, an introvert, someone who stood, stood back and wanted to hear other people's stories. So listening, one of the lost arts in the pandemic era here in certain, certain ways. And so uh, passions are, what would you like to use your gifts? Gifts are, what would you like to do? Passions are, who would you like to do those with? Who would you like to serve? Or what problems are, are you curious about using your gifts uh, beyond yourself in the service of? And values are, where do you want to do this? Where, and if you're working, it would be your work environment <clears throat> or your volunteer environment, or where do you find yourself uh, the best fit? So many people today find that they, they have the gifts and passions, but they're in an environment that's toxic, that's not good for them. And that's the number one knockout factor in most career research th these days. So what do you find would be your calling? If you had to summarize your number, your gifts and your number one gift, what would it be in, 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 in certain ways? When we're using our gifts, when we get up in the morning to do things we really care about in environments that fit our values, we're in what they call flow. Some people call it being in the zone, but it's a flow state where we find ourselves naturally energized and wanting to do what we, we do, not having to force ourselves. So, Oh, uh, let's look at your some practices here. But first of all, let's just pause for a moment and delete the word still from your mind. Oh, so look at this old who me? Do you recognize this person? Maybe not. This is Bruce Springsteen in his early 70s, still rocking out on Broadway, new, new album, new book, new things. I'm not saying he's your exemplar of aging. But aging in some ways is certainly medical, economic, but it also is about meaning. It's about continuing to grow whole and continue to grow. And so how old is old? You know, subjective aging. Uh, I'm 77. I'm not trying to be younger. I'm trying to be a full out 77, the way that subjectively, you know, life isn't perfect. But I'm still, and I hate that word, and I want to take it out of your lexicon as, as well. Oh, you're still playing music. Oh, you're still climbing mountains. Oh, you're still writing. Oh, well, who gets to define that? That's a default word in certain ways to get rid of in, in, in certain ways. Just like a uh, muscle that atrophies, we need to get up every day with a sense of purpose. Who are your exemplars of purpose? Who, who are the people who continually are growing and growing whole, not just old? And so uh, one of mine was Viktor Frankl. And I have others in my life as, as well. Viktor Frankl passed away a dozen years ago at the age of 93, but he still lives to me as an exemplar all the way to the end, the very last breath of somebody who really turned crisis into a calling. And so finally, this this... Uh, to summarize, unlock the power of purpose. 
how do we unlock the power of purpose? Let me give you a simple practice here. Something that I'm going to challenge you to do tomorrow or today for that matter. And that, that is, uh, is, as I said, purpose is, is a verb. Purpose is a path and purpose is a practice. And the choice is yours, whether you want to live purposefully or not. And so um, take out, when you get a chance, a little sticky note like this. Just a little st sticky note and write the words grow and give on it. Here's mine. And put it on a mirror that you would see every day, like where you get up in the morning and look in the mirror. And ask yourself tomorrow morning, how am I going to grow and give today? And then at the end of the day, ask yourself, how did I grow and give today? Hold yourself accountable. Say yes to life, as Viktor Frankl says. And the, the, the choice is yours. And so that's kind of like doing a checkup every day. I've given you some things to think about here, about your own purpose and living your own version of the good life and maybe letting go of the default life or moving into elderhood, making that shift, making that choice, perhaps reimagining re retirement in, in, in uh, certain ways. So say yes uh, to life. And uh, life is short and we need to, to to be present on, on a day-to-day -day basis. And so final thing here I wanna say is that uh, a number of years back, I was teaching a seminar and it was about four hours from where I'm sitting right now. And someone walked into the room and handed me a slip of paper and said, call home right now. And I went like right now in mid sentence when I'm standing up in front of a crowd of about 400 people and they said, now. I took a break, pushed the pause button, turned it over to one of my colleagues and went to the phone. And my wife said, uh, Richard, your mother, has, uh, who is 78, has had a stroke. She's in intensive care at St. Joseph's Hospital in St. Paul, Minnesota, four or five hours from here. Uh, she's not going to make it through the night. You better come home now if you want to see her. And uh, so I left and drove the four or five hours and got there late, very late in the night time, walked into intensive care. And there was my wife, my mother taking big sobbing breaths. Uh, I asked the intensive care nurse to leave me alone for a minute. And so I could just collect my wits and I just broke down and sobbed. And then it occurred to me, maybe I should thank her. So I got up on the bed and I said, mom, thank you. And when I said, it's time to go, thank you, it's time to go, she took two, opened her eyes, took two more breaths and died in my arms. And I tell you that because this purpose thing, to unlock it, it's in us. You can't always see it, but you can name it and claim it. She was a stay-at-home mom, volunteer, my dad, average Joe, going to work every day, providing for his two sons and his spouse. And I think at the end of all of our lives, we want to know that we grew and gave, and we want to know that our life mattered. And to this moment, I think that that was what completed things for her in certain ways. So I hope this gives you pause to grow and give and that you'll try it for a week. You'll, have, you'll get a felt sense of purpose, not just a concept, but a real felt sense beyond yourself of what it means to live purposefully. So with that, uh, uh, show you a copy of my latest work, Who Do You Want to Be When You Grow Old? The Path of Purposeful Aging. You can go to my website, richardleiter.com, and there are under the section called resources, there's all kinds of free downloads, which will include this Happify um, uh, talk today. And you can go, of course, as Abby said, to Happify's website to get uh, this and um, some of these slides. So Abby, let me turn it back to you and see what wants to happen in terms of uh, questions. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Richard. And thank you for that touching story of your mother and for the napkin test and the sticky note. I think they're all things that we can take to heart do easily and definitely see a change. Lisa asks, Richard, if you find yourself in a career 
in quotes, so assuming from your uh, four section slide, what is the first step to get towards meaning? Uh, the first step is to define your napkin test. And that is, uh, we all have, you know, want to make more money perhaps or live in different, but what, what, are, what do you bring to the party? What are your gifts, passions, and values? I uh, once, uh, bef uh, early in my career, I was in what was called personnel at the time. And it was um, now called HR, human resources. And, but I had a side hustle. They call it a side hustle now. And it was called Lunch Hour Limited. I would coach, you buy me lunch and I'll coach you. Because I was a coach masquerading as an HR professional, but doing well at that. At that. But I found that my coaching, I couldn't wait to do Lunch Hour Limited. And I found that I was very successful at it, good at it, and enjoyed it immensely. And the hour went by just like that using my gifts of listening, coaching, and doing things I didn't do actually in my HR role. And I had an 80% success ratio. 80% of the people I coached made a major change. They might've gone back and changed the job that they were doing. Uh, they might've moved to a different part of the organization. My boss, the CEO, didn't think it was such a cool idea for me doing this, but, and about 10% actually left the organization. And they probably were thinking about that. So the key is to figure out what do you really love to do? And what are you passionate about? What are you curious about? What are the things that really move the needle for you that you get up in the morning, you could use your gifts on those things. And third, what kind of environment, what kind of values and what kind of environment are you uh, wanting to, to, to do? And so uh, the starting point then is to go back to your current crummy job, if that's what it is, or your job that you don't love, and uh, ask yourself, how could I bring 25% more of my gifts here without being asked to? And what could I let go of if possible? So that's a starting point. And maybe even create a side hustle, create something at least in your mind. What would a side hustle look like, even though you got to pay the bills and pay the mortgage right now? Uh, one of my colleagues, Chris Farrell, wrote a book called Purpose and a Paycheck. We all want purpose and a paycheck. I mean, at, usually at some point in our life that may change. But but uh, how do I how do I figure out if it's just a paycheck? You're going to have burnout, or rust out, overdoing or underbeing. How do I figure out something that can bring really aliveness and vitality? So that's an idea. Thank you. Um, another listener asked, how can I start my dream of writing if I'm over 60? And maybe we can kind of look at this through the lens of any big dream or goal that our listeners might want to achieve if they're over a certain age. I hear this so often. People say, oh, I, I want to write a book. And I say, well, what is your writing practice? And they look at me kind of like, huh? And I said, you know, if, you're, if you don't have a practice, you'll be a waiter, not a writer. You need a practice. For me, my practice, I call it my golden hour. My golden hour. Every morning, including this morning, I uh, make a fresh cup of, of coffee and I sit down for at least an hour, maybe 90 minutes and write. And most of what I write isn't worth reading, you know, publishing, but I, I enjoy it so much that the time flies. And so... Um, what is your writing practice? If you want to be a writer, create a practice and maybe create a purpose, a writing partner or join a writing group. But without a practice, you'll be a waiter, not a writer. William Stafford wrote a poem a day for 30 years. Can you imagine a poem a day for 30 years? And when asked at a board meeting that I was at, how could you do this? And he said, oh, lower your expectations. We all smiled. He didn't. He said, I don't get up every day to write a published work. I get up every day to write because I love to write. And I find myself passionate about, about the practice of, of, of writing. So lower your expectations. Don't get up every day and, and have the critic on your shoulder say, oh, this isn't any good. Just write. Thank you. Um, a couple of other people have mentioned a some questions around the first step. How do you figure out and find what your gifts are? Well, uh, a simple way to do it is to do the calling cards. 
And uh, the calling cards is available. You can look at it on my website. You can order it from Amazon. It's a it's a deck of cards, simple deck of cards that has 52 gifts, callings, and it takes you through a process of identifying and claim, uh, naming and claiming your your calling and your 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 gifts. Uh, an, an easier way, perhaps, is to take out five index cards and give them to five different people with the question at the top. What do you what do you observe that I love to do? And ask them to write down what they observe, and then look for the threads and themes when they when they, you get that back. And maybe even have a sounding board. A sounding board is are your committed listeners, and and bring a sounding board of those five people together to get some feedback on what, what do they see you loving to do, enjoying. What do they see you doing effortlessly and superbly? What is it that you can't recall learning? And that, that's such a big one. I want to dwell on this for just a second here and just say, what does it mean I can't recall learning it? Well, if you can't recall learning something that's just come to you naturally and automatically, often you don't give it much value because you don't have a degree in it, you don't have a certificate in it, but you do it exceptionally well or you enjoy it, you love doing it, and your hand turns to it naturally when you're even when you're not paid for it. And... Uh, so uh, a, a sounding board is like your kitchen cabinet. So have a calling card, kitchen cabinet, start with the five index cards, maybe do the, the, the exercise and get some feedback. Thank you. I'll take you right to the next, uh, next step in that question. Um, Pat asks, if you know your gifts, but don't know your passion, who to serve and value, where, where to serve, how do you go about finding those two missing pieces of the puzzle? Well, the the passions um, uh, starts with <clears throat> curiosity. What are you really curious curious about? What keeps you up at night? I gave a talk uh, a while back, and I was in the green room uh, before going out to a large uh, live audience. And also in the green room was Richard Saul Warman, who is the founder of TED. You know, TED Talks. And he said, what are you going to talk about, Richard? And I said, purpose. And he kind of shrugged and he's older than me. He said, uh, young man. I said, well, what are you going to talk about? And he said, curiosity. Don't you think it takes curiosity? You have to be curious about something to be purposeful. And I said, absolutely. That's, that's true. If you're not curious about yourself, curious about something in the world, you're not going to be uh, uh, curious. And he actually said the Ted dynasty now ted talks was created based on one word curiosity and he said he said i was curious about technology entertainment and design and i created this is warman i created the ultimate dinner party and ted and it turned into ted the ultimate i was going to invite six people and have the question about uh, the intersection of technology entertainment and design and find out where it went. And he said, then I started to do more of that and pretty soon it turned into TED Talks. So the question back to the, the uh, person who asked is, what are you really curious about? What keeps you up at night? When you talk about grow and give, what, what areas might you wanna go back to school or what do you read about or what do you think about or what causes are out there that you would love to spend time working on? And um, so, uh, just to take this one little step further, there are six steps. Step one is reflect. Step two is connect, talk to others. Step three is explore. Get out there and explore things you're curious about. Step four is choose. Choose something to do a deeper dive into. And maybe it's, you know, you work and you don't have time, but you have to create some time on your calendar perhaps to do this. And step five is repack. What do you need to let go of on your calendar or financially or whatever it is in order to have time to, to do this exploration more deeply? And then act. Take one small step into the area you're curious about. Thank you. Interesting story about the start of TED Talks. Someone else asks, as an educated stay-at-home mom, now an empty nester, I struggle with finding purpose. What are your thoughts? I wonder if others are in a similar oh, situation. Too. I, and, and I hear this all the time, and I'm and I'm tired of purpose with this because I'm living purposefully by raising a family. 
which I totally acknowledge and, and, and affirm. So I would just get back to, um, I talked a, a little bit earlier, but make an appointment on your calendar with yourself every day. We give so much to our family, so much to our schools, to the world, and we need to, to uh, spend a little bit of time with ourselves. So put an appointment, even if it's fit for 15 minutes, hopefully for an hour, but put, it, put yourself, make an appointment with yourself on your calendar. If it's not every day, at least a couple times a week where you, it's just your time, it's time for you. And so, it, you know, you're, you're not going to be as good at home as you could be if you're not taking care of yourself. Self-care is critical in, in uh, all periods of, of life, particularly with someone who's stay at home like that. You need oxygen. You need time for yourself. So appointment with yourself. And the last thing I would say is this. No, N-O is a complete sentence. Learn to say no. Decide what you need to say no to today in order to have time to say yes. People find it so hard for me to say no. Uh, I find that if you can't say no, you don't have time to say yes to the things that you really love. So learn to say no as a complete sentence and mean it. Thank you. That's helpful. Deborah asks, I'm struggling with the completion of passion project and not sure how to break the invisible barrier of what's holding me back. Any advice? I'm not sure what the invisible barrier is. I wonder if maybe you could speak to kind of getting past a plateau in a long-term project of passion or finding purpose. Yeah, I'll go back to uh, create a sounding board. A sounding board is essential. I wouldn't coach anybody over 50 years of coaching almost if they didn't have a sounding board. That's how important I thought it was. And particularly at certain points in life, there are four people on a sounding board. Number one, most important is a committed listener. Somebody who listens to you and practices care versus cure. They care enough to say, tell me more about that rather than curing or fig, you know, you know, telling you their story. Secondly, as a wise elder, somebody who's a little bit further down the path who can help you see the big picture. Third is a wise younger, somebody who's younger than you that can ask you questions a lot about why are you doing what you're doing and maybe, maybe you know, open up some new doors that way. And fourth is a purpose partner, somebody who can really hold your feet to the fire. You say you want to do this. What is your practice today? How did you do? What is your practice tomorrow? What did you do? So the purpose partner could be a, the committed listener, but I like to have more than one, like good boards have more than one person. They have a diversity. So who's on your sounding board? And then have, 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 uh, give them to help you through that invisible barrier. Thank you. And, and Karen asks, is the research on increased happiness in later life based on people who have a certain level of financial resources? No. no. Uh, I mean, yes and no. It, it depends on the study you're talking about. There's studies. Um, I've been leading walking safaris in Africa for 35 years. I've sat around the fire with wise elders from hunter-gatherer tribes who have nothing. And one of those, and they and they share everything, and they're they're living purposefully. One of those hunter gatherer elders asked me, Richard. He said, "You know what the two most important days are in our lives?" And I said, "Sure, birth and death." And he was like, "Oh, he was chagrin." He said, "Yeah, birth because of of uh, you know infant mortality," but he said the second most important day in the life of a hunter gatherer is the day that they determine why they were born, how they fit in, how they're gifts, so to speak, in my life, fit into society here. That's the only way we survive for 100,000 years hunting and gathering is by sharing. And it's about purpose and purposeful living in cer certain ways in my own uh, lexicon. And so, um, but, you know, and I've studied there tribes and in different continents, uh, but it depends on the study. Wow. Yes, that's a whole um, other facet of your exploration that we have yet to unpack. But that's really our next Happify dialogue will be around repacking your bags, which is which happened in Africa, basically. You can feel free to give us just a, a minute of uh, of information about that. I feel like people might be interested. Well, 
I've been leading walking safaris in Tanzania, East Africa, starting in 1983. And that's a longer story how I got there. But the point, the point is I was out backpacking with 12 people, like some of you on this uh, call, perhaps. Uh, and uh, I was, we were being led by a wise elder from a tribe called the Maasai. And he noticed that I was really struggling carrying my pack through this beautiful, along the Serengeti Plains and the, on Kilimanjaro's off. And I put my pack down when we, we got to our first destination. And he came over and he said, Richard, what's in these things you're, you all are carrying anyway? And I proceeded to take everything out of the pack and put it on the ground in front of him. And, you know, my wilderness first aid kit and water filters and root finders and clothes. And, and he came over and he said, Richard, tell me, does all this make you happy? And I got real defensive. And I said, well, I need this for this. And I realized I was carrying about twice as much as I needed. So were you. And so I came out to the fire that night and said, I just had this experience with, his name is Koye, this Maasai elder. I decided I'm going to leave, I'm going to lighten my load and repack my bags and live, leave half of my stuff at the village here. Well, that became the mantra for the rest of the trip. People said, I, I need to repack my life, not just my backpack. So, uh, and I, and so we came back and I co-authored the book, Repacking Your Bags, Lighten Your Load for the Good Life and the Good Life Inventory is on my website, but it's also the, the the core of the book, living in the place you love with the things, you know, as I said earlier, place, people, right work, and and, uh, and purpose. So the question, does all this make you happy? What does make you happy? And are you living the good life? Thank you for that teaser. Yeah, that will be, that could definitely be another topic we'd love to cover. It's great. And thank um, you all for listening. Listening is a great privilege and a great honor for me. And so thank you for listening. Absolutely. Thank you for being here, giving us your time, being a great audience and participating and asking all these questions. And I really hope you enjoyed it. If you want any more information on some of these topics or activities on these topics that we discussed today, please check out the Happify Tracks. We have two related ones uh, called Empty Nest, Full Life and another called Find Your Calling. So I think those would really complement the presentation today. Stay Thank tuned you. as well. Next month, our webinar is on the mental and physical benefits of feeling awe by expert Jonah Paquette. So thank you so much again for being here and thank you, Richard. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.